Hello, we are back for chapter 18, and it is titled, With All Deliberate Speed, from the novel Hidden Figures. Chapter 18, we are rocking and rolling through one of my favorite novels, and it's so new, but the information is so old. So here we go, and remember today, as we're listening and we're learning, keep your ears open for things that interest you, keep your ears open for things that you have a question about. And when you get to class, ask those questions. You don't have to just answer all the questions that your teachers give you. You can ask the questions and then hopefully it will build a wonderful discussion between you, your classmates, and your teacher. So let's get into our story. With all deliberate speed. In 1958, Catherine Goble and her research, research group took on what seemed like the world's most interesting challenge, sending a human being into space. NASA reorganized the research team so that they were doing all they could do, all they could do to turn space flight from a comic book fantasy into a reality. The space task group set up to be the nerve center of the new operation was made up of many engineers and female computers from Catherine's group. The Flight Research Division and PARD, remember back from chapter 17, the, or 16, the rocket specialists. The new group decided that their first space mission needed an appropriate name. So they decided to call the effort project Mercury named for the god of travelers in Roman mythology. That is so interesting. The space program brought a lot of attention to Hampton, Virginia. Unfortunately, even as the engineers and mathematicians at Langley embraced the future, the state seemed stuck in the past. Unwilling to let go of its segregationist policies, Virginia's legacy as the birthplace of humanity's first step into the heavens would have to compete with its embarrassing reputation as the country's most outspoken opponent to integration of public schools. Virginia schools were in chaos. Some, some schools had to try to comply with the Supreme Court's decision requiring states to integrate their schools with all deliberate speed. The governor refused to allow integration. So he ordered that the doors to those schools be chained shut. 13,000 students found themselves sitting at home in the fall of 1958. It's something similar to the pandemic of 2020, 2021. Students found themselves sitting at home, too. So remember, there's nothing new under the sun. Let's get back. Black and white families struggled to send their children to private schools or to move their school-aged children to live with relatives in other areas where they could get an education. In 1959, Virginia's government finally reopened most of the schools in the state. But... The administrators in Prince Edward County, which included Farmville and Dorothy Vaughn's former high school, R.R. Moon, Moulton, chose to defund the school system rather than integrate. They just stopped giving the schools the money they needed to stay open. The Prince Edward schools remained cl closed from 1959 through 1964. In other parts of the states, including those in Hampton Roads area, the schools remained open but segregated. Despite the Brown versus Board of Education decision making segregation illegal, in the fall of 1958, the children of Langley's black and white employees returned to their separate routines 
at their separate schools. Catherine Goldwick didn't have the energy to spend fighting with the local school system. She didn't approve of segregation, but she wanted her children to get a good education. She continued to push her children to excel in their segregated schools. She was trying to balance the demands of being a single mother and working at a demanding job. She lived with the grief of having lost her husband years before, but she didn't let that side of her life show in public. Between work life and home life, Catherine, Re Catherine regularly attended worship services and sang in the church choir. One evening in 1958, a handsome 33-year-old army captain named James Johnson came to choir practice at Catherine's church. He had grown up in Hampton and trained in aviation metal smithing. During World War II, he became an expert in aircraft maintenance and repair. After completing his service, he landed a clerk job at the Commerce Department in Washington, D.C. He also signed up for the U.S. Navy Reserve, repairing planes for test flights. He loved planes just as much as Catherine did. Catherine, Catherine hadn't intended to fall in love, but she and James, Jim, began dating. Jim's devotion to the military made it easy for him to understand Catherine's commitment to her work at Langley. He was also sensitive to the secretive nature of her work and the long hours it demanded. During this intense period of competition with the Russians, people at Langley often worked until 10 p.m. or later. The Mercury Mission. Now, Catherine worked long hours on her new assignment involving Project Mercury. In a less urgent time, the researchers at NASA might have followed a slower and more systematic approach to their work conducting careful and measured investigations of all possible options in space travel. With the Russians off to what looked like a commanding lead, NASA sought the simplest, fastest, and most reliable way to get into space. The engineers approached Project Mercury by breaking it down into constituent parts. One team looked at the shape of the aircraft determining that it should be streamlined to minimize aerodynamic drag. Another team of researchers showed that a needle-shaped structure would most efficiently deflect the extreme heat caused when the aircraft zoomed through the atmosphere on re-entry. The recommended a, they recommended a blunt-based body, something shaped like a cork which could or would create a shock wave as it came to earth, minimizing the extreme heat and keeping the person inside safe. The spacecraft would have to be small so astronauts could be no taller than five feet, 11 inches, and had to weigh less than 180 pounds. Each astronaut candidate was required to be a qualified test pilot younger than 40 years old with at least a bachelor's degree. After months of searching, NASA selected the final crew. In 1959, the NASA had held a press conference to present the Mercury 7 astronauts to the world. Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, Gordon Cooper, Wally Shira, Deke Slayton, John Glenn, and Scott Carpenter. Don't forget that name, John Glenn. There was a great deal of preparation to be done by everyone, from researcher to astronaut to an office on the Langley campus next door to the Space Task Group. Langley employees loved catching a glimpse of the astronauts who would become celebrities walking around the campus. The Mercury 7 trained hard, but both physically and in the classroom, preparing their bodies and minds for the unprecedented journey 
ahead of them. While the astronauts were preparing for this important mission, Catherine Goldway had to calculate the flight, the flight trajectories. In other words, she had to plan the exact path that the spacecraft would travel across Earth's surface. From the moment it lifted off the launch pad and flew through the atmosphere and into space until it splashed back down into the Atlantic Ocean. Project Mercury required so much work that the space task group, which coordinated all aspects of the space mission, relied on other divisions at Langley and at other NASA centers to help carry out their gargantuan task. Hmm. Day after day, the team poured over equations, scrawled ideas on blackboards, evaluated each other's work, erased it, started over. Catherine's new job, trajectory analysis, involved the study of how a projectile moved through space, both here on Earth and in outer space. This work was similar to that done by other female computers who spent thousands upon thousands of woman hours computing mathematical tables, which soldiers used to figure out how to fire their weapons and hit their targets. So fascinating. Let me get back in here. The space task group decided that the best way to send the first person into space was with a simple ballistic flight. The capsule would be fired into space like a bullet from a gun or a tennis ball from a, mach from a ball machine. The first sp spacecraft would not, have, would not have any propulsion of its own. The capsule would go up, then come down, and land in the Atlantic Ocean, where the capsule landed depended on where it was launched. The calculations had to be exact so that the astronaut would return close enough to waiting U.S. Navy ships to be quickly hoisted out of the water and pulled to safety. Catherine understood that carrying out an orbital mission would be more difficult than the simpler ballistic flights. The team would have to plan the journey so precisely that the spacecraft would pass through the atmosphere, hurtle along on a looping circle around the planet, and land in exactly the right place. Let me do it, Catherine said to her boss, working as a computer or math aide, as the women were now called under NASA. Catherine had proven herself. She was older than many of the engineers she worked with, but she, ma she matched them at every turn for intelligence, enthusiasm, and work stamina. Tell me where you want the man to land, and I'll tell you where to send him up. Catherine knew the math as well as anyone else on the team. As engineer named Ted Skop Skopinski was assigned the task of preparing the research report, and as his computer, Catherine assisted. He thought she was smart and he respected her work, so he gave her the opportunity to take on challenging assignments. She had to consider factors that were unique to an orbital flight. For example, she needed to take into account the fact that Earth isn't a perfect sphere, but a little bit squat, like a mandarin orange or a cutie, what you might know them as. She also had to factor in the speed of Earth's rotation. Everything had to be spelled out, quantified, and identified. Now, over the months of 1959, a 34-page research paper began to take shape. It was remarkably complex, filled with equations, charts, and tables of calculations. Catherine should finish the report said Ted, the engineer she had been collaborating with. She's done most of the work anyway. Catherine's boss, Henry, had a reputation for being less than supportive of the advancement of female employees, but Ted encouraged her to put the finishing touches on her report. Her boss grudgingly gave in after. After Ted made the case for her, the report was titled 
determination of azimuth angle at burnout for placing a satellite over a selected Earth position. After 10 months of editorial meetings, analysis, recommendations, and revisions, the report was published in September of 1960. It was the first time a woman working in the Aerospace Mechanics Division had managed to get her name on a research report. For Catherine, the completion of the report marked the beginning of a new phase of her life, not just at Langley, but at home too. Somehow, during the long days of 1959, she accepted an offer even more enticing than being invited to the editorial meetings at work. Jim Johnson asked her to marry him. The couple wed in August of 1959 when she put her name on the final draft of her first research report, she signed her new name, Katherine G. Johnson. And we will end chapter 18 today. And yes, Katherine Johnson is now the new wife and is the first to put her name on a project research done by a woman. So that if that doesn't interest you, Lots more will, but please just remember, no matter the time that it takes you to achieve something, just do it your best. And you have no idea what doors will open for you or people that come after you. So study hard, listen well, and ask all the questions because the questions you ask, they're going to be like a little sponge in your brain and you remember them more than you knew. So see you later. Hi. Thank you. Bye-bye.